So here's our title page, uh, Becoming Universal New History of Modern Computing. That's our presentation tonight on May 18th. And um, you can see uh, among our sponsors tonight are Loyola University, and it's their 150th year. Um, and we can see Alvin's on the screen there. Alvin, do you want to say something? Yeah, sure. I'm really sorry I could not be there in uh, person. I'm actually um, in uh, California for business trip, but uh, thank you to uh, Mark and to Greg and the rest of the team for being there to have our first actual in-person uh, meeting in two years. I think the last one that we had was actually in Loyola, actually in the same campus. Um, and it was, um, uh, it was, uh, uh, we, we actually showed some type of a kind of a video or so about data science or so. I think it was from Data IQ or so. They actually had um, a, a presentation or so. So that was our, our last meeting in uh, February. I think it was February 2020 or so was our last uh, meeting before we became everything all virtual. So, yeah, uh, I wish I'm, I'm there there tonight, uh, but uh, thank you all for making it in person. Right. Great. And um, it's... Uh... <clears throat> Never too early to come and see a live performance. Um, we're going to be doing another one next month, and we'll see that slide soon. But so we'll talk about um, uh, the group. Um, so if you could advance the next slide. Great. Now we're recording. OK. And uh, hopefully there's a bit of an echo here. Um, so I'm going to move out of the room here for a moment to avoid the echo. So anyways, we're the, uh, <clears throat> I, our group participates along with the IEEE Chicago uh, Computer Society of Chicago. And um, that uh, group holds quarterly chat meetings on topics dealing with many topics, as you can see there. The chair is Alvin. And, uh, Vice Chair is Gina Martinez, and there you could see all of their uh, information listed to contact them. And if we can move to the next slide, um, you'll see that here is the information about our group, the ACM Chicago, <clears throat> ACM Chicago, where we hold monthly chat meetings dealing in topics of computing, which, uh, you know, our characteristic point is that we um, or we're a variety show. We do a different topic each month. Sometimes they're related, sometimes they're not. And I think that's a great uh, advantage to our audience that uh, they can get to experience and hear about various topics, some which they have some experience with and many that they don't. And uh, there's all of our contact information. Uh, Alvin, as you saw before, he's the chair. Um, I'm the vice chair. My name is Mark Tempkin. Our treasurer is Greg Newmark. You can see him waving with the mask on. And um, there's all of our contact information. So let's move to the next page. And we can tell you about what's coming up next month. And I'm not sure if he's going to bring the dog. But I think he's. I think I think he's suggesting that the dog might, might be a co-speaker. So this is Jorge Coca, and he's a Google developer expert. And his topic is going to be on Flutter, zero slides, all code, live remote presentation. So this is definitely if you're in the area, I bet that it's going to be a lot of fun to be here for a live presentation. And just to just to add to that, uh, Jorge actually is a good friend of mine and uh, ex colleague uh, when we used to work together um, at BMW in Chicago. So he's a very good, uh, excellent uh, developer and uh, advocate uh, for Flutter. And he's got a great looking dog. Yes, so, that too as well. <laughs> okay, so let's go on to the next slide here. And. For those of you that are in our audience, we have a book signing. I know that uh, we've already sold a couple of books now and you can get your signed copy of Becoming Universal, A New History of Modern Computing, which is at the Loyola University Fallout Bookstore table, which is uh, right in the room here. And uh, this is a first edition of sorts. So if you get it signed, you know, it's one of those potentially rare first editions. If you can hold on to it for 
a century, maybe 50 years, you know, we'll see. Okay, let's go on to the next slide for our introduction to our speaker. And, um, and of course, we're still waiting for, you know, this is a new environment here. So people have, um, uh, this is a new place for people to get to. So we may spin out a little time here. Um, so our speaker, Thomas Haig, uh, I first noticed him in the, um, I think it was every quarter in the communications of the Association for Computing Machinery, which is the journal that the ACM prints monthly, very great slick magazine. There's uh, many articles that I understand, some that I try to understand, some that I pretend to understand, but his column, I always look forward to reading. It's one of these, um, it, you're sorry when he reaches the end. I mean, it's, he's a really good writer and he's writing about a great topic that uh, all of us have some experience with because we've been there for part of the journey. And he's also written several books on, uh, including a book about ENIAC. And tonight he's gonna to be talking about his most recent book, Becoming Universal, A New History of Modern Computing. So I'm going to surrender the stage to our speaker, Thomas Haig. So let's have a big round of internet and live applause for our speaker, Thomas Haig. Great. Um, thanks. Uh, good to be here. I think uh, we have a, a bunch of people online. Um, you won't be able to buy a book here at the book table with apologies to Oyo University Bookstore, um, but it's of course available on Amazon. Um, so I'm going to talk through a little bit um, something about what's new and different um, about this book versus previous overviews of computing. I'm not going to try and give you the 50-minute version of the history of computing. Um, what I'm going to do is take that time to talk to you about why you might need to read this book, how it's different from other books that have been written previously, some of the trade-offs and decisions that we made in writing it, um, some of the things that we're covering for the first time that haven't previously been covered uh, in a book of this kind, etc. So the challenge um, I'm going to argue for you is that writing a one volume history of the computer, which you can more or less lift up, right? So you'll see some small book, it's not light, um, but you also don't need a forklift to pick it up. With. You know, it's, it's a book that is within the realms of what a publisher might publish and you might choose to read. And doing that for the computer is harder than for most other technologies, right? because there is a sense in which the computer has become a universal technology. So in this first section, I'm going to talk through that idea and talk about what I mean here by universal. Um, so the book starts out with ENIAC, um, released to the world on the front page of the New York Times in 1946. I have written previously a whole book about that. So it's a natural starting point for this one. It starts out, uh, First programmable electronic computer. So that's why we start the first computer to be both programmable and electronic. It's a big thing. Uh, basically, formed a kind of mean divider. Um, people walked around as they're doing uh, here on, uh, on this uh, picture in the corner. Looking from the book, they were standing inside the computer. The floor plan here showing you how the different 40 different units of the computer basically formed a room that people were working within. Uh, despite weighing many tons, it nevertheless had only 200 decimal digits of high-speed writable electronic storage, and it could do about 3,000 multiplications a second, which was much faster than anything that previously existed, but at the same time, not particularly fast by modern standards. Uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes here just to give you a sense of what our starting point is. Um, so you'll get an idea of how far we've come from that and the challenges of encompassing that journey in one book. So the input and output of ENIAC were primarily punch cards. That was something that existed before for use with electronic mechanical machines, small pieces of cardboard. Each of them could store 80 decimal digits. 
Uh, we've got two pieces of punch card machinery here, and here is uh, an idea of what that's involving. So what comes out of the machine, the only um, output that takes physical form is the punch cards. Take a deck of punch cards, run them through the tabulating machine. It's giving you a sense of the amount of human labor that was involved in computing in the early days. So you'd call this an automatic computer program to carry out a series of steps, but getting it to do anything still required a lot of hands-on human attention. Um, the deck is now going to run there through the thing, out comes the printout. That's the designers of the machine to look at. Because it had only 200 decimal digits of storage, it was possible to use small neon lights, which for the purpose of this newsreel footage were covered with ping pong balls, which had numbers stuck on the front. And you basically look around the room and see at a glance the content of every digit of storage. And as the computation went along, you could see those lights flashing and changing as the numbers stored in the different parts of memory changed. And it was originally programmed by turning control switches and plugging cables, as we're seeing here in the video. Um, in this picture here, you can see another shot of people working on that. So the computer consisted of a large number of largely independent digital logic units. And by moving those plug wires and moving switches, you essentially can build special purpose digital logic to carry out the computation that you wanted to carry out. After 1948, that changed. They left those main switching wires where they were, and they were moving switches on this panel here, in the bottom right, uh, to enter programs and data more akin to the way that later computers were programmed. So that's our starting point. Now, previously I had that luxury of writing an entire book about one computer, which really lets you like zoom in, consider many different aspects of it, tell the story richly. And the challenge that we had with this book is writing a book that is somewhat bigger, but still only one book, about all the computers. So beginning with ENIAC and getting to the modern world. Now, if you consider an example of a computer, uh, technology that was enormously important in the 20th century, the automobile, then a historian writing on one volume history of that has sort of been challenged because it's technology that became so important in so many different areas of American life. Right? So you might need to talk about white flight and suburbs post World War II. You might need to talk about teenagers kissing in cars in popular culture. You might need to talk about the change of American foreign policy to be about protecting access to cheap gasoline, right? I mean, there's a lot of things there to talk about. But in terms of the artifact itself, from the 1910s to the present day, there's a lot of continuity in terms of the scale of what we're talking about. So you're talking about a box with four wheels that moves along on an asphalt surface. It's got a steering wheel, it carries a roughly family-sized group of people at a speed that's risen from maybe 40 miles an hour to 80 miles an hour if there's no traffic. And it's produced in hugely expensive capital-intensive factories by basically in the US, the same three main producers, Chrysler Ford General Motors from the 1930s to the present day. It's mostly bought by individuals and it costs several months' wages for a skilled worker to buy a recently okay. So, in that sense, despite the riches of the history, someone trying to write a one-volume history of cars in America or even cars in the world has done a relatively easy job. Whereas with the computer, it's ENIAC, which is actually newer than that Model T Ford. Right? And here are some of the things that computers are today. In the sense of what we're dealing with, right? So, obviously, this thing here, this supercomputer, is kind of the modern version of ENIAC. So they don't stop being big, expensive devices used by scientists to do large-scale numerical computations in places like Los Alamos. But, uh, well, this is a computer too. 
and that touch screen TV is a computer, and obviously that laptop is a computer, that digital projector is a computer, um, that control panel over there that looks like it's going to change the temperature in the room, also a computer. You know, the most of the computers in the world are actually these, these things that we don't even realize are computers. Uh, unless we're computer scientists. And that's one of the things that we explore in this book that makes it a little bit different from earlier histories of computing. We try and look at um, all those things that the computer has become, including digital media devices, uh, communications devices, that smartwatch there. Uh, and one of the terms that uh, actually Paul brought to the book is the idea of computers having dissolved other technologies. So in some cases, technologies just stop existing as discrete things and get merged into our smartphones and our other computers. And in other cases, there's still a freestanding artifact, like this uh, old school thing here. I can see a slight weakness here with having the zoom on the, on the thing, but uh, there's an old school smartphone underneath that zoom panel there. Um, right, or this thing that kind of is a photocopy, but really it's just another computer with a built-in printer and a scanner. Right, this thing, okay, looks kind of like it's still a TV, but really it's just a monitor and a computer running special purpose software, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one of the ideas here uh, from the economic study for general purpose technology. So economists have said that there's a handful of technologies like steam power, electrical power, the internal combustion engine, that have major impacts across the entire economy. Uh, that take decades to really be reflected from their initial invention because they have to be adopted. Entire factories and cities and so on have to be rebuilt around the potential of technology like electrical power or electrical light. So in a sense, a computer is similar to those, except more so, right? Um, so we might say, we pretty much do in the book, that it becomes a technology that's so exceptionally general purpose that it does at least approach the idea of universality. But of course, the computer scientists in the industry will be accustomed to the idea of thinking about the computer already as a universal machine. It doesn't take a second to talk about what we're doing here. It's kind of the same, but also kind of different. Um, but the title for this talk um, and the introduction of the book is Becoming Universal. So in that sense, the story of how the computer becomes universal. But in many cases, people drawing on Alan Turing's 1936 paper on computable numbers, which introduced the idea of something that Turing called a universal machine, and it's more commonly known as the universal Turing machine. Essentially, a computing machine that takes as part of its data input the description of the rules followed by another computing machine. So you can have one computing machine that can compute any number that any computing machine can compute. So people have been extremely eager to conflate that with actual programmable computers, as we will see in the titles of some of these books and articles here, and to say computers are universal because they're Turing machines. And I stress. We're arguing for something a little bit different here, because from this viewpoint of theoretical universality, as we have in computer science, the computer has always been existed, even before, always been universal, even before it existed, right? So remember, Turing's paper 1936, ENIAC, the first programmable electron computer in 1945. I mean, they also kind of go down this avenue of saying that all the people who built computers in the 40s just wanted to build Turing machines, which is sort of ludicrous, but we don't need to get into that one now. The point is, from this theoretical viewpoint, even ENIAC, that huge, clunky, extremely limited machine we saw, is conceptually universal. But of course, it is, right? ENIAC couldn't be a smartwatch. It couldn't stream Netflix, right? <laughs> There's lots of things that it really couldn't, in any practical sense, do. And the story of Apple is basically how the computer evolved to be able to do those things. So certainly, the fact that the computer is programmable, I mean, has to be a part of explaining why it's able to do so many things. But at the same time, we'd say, well, the computer is never truly going to be universal. It's never going to do everything for everybody. But if you step back a little bit, ENIAC, which we saw, which was for many years the only program electronic computer in the world, was a very specialized technology programmed by a few dozen people to automate mathematical tasks, mostly numerical mathematics. Today, for well, this kind of computer, the smartphone, at this point, most of the people on Earth have one, and we tend to use it to mediate pretty much everything we do in our daily activities. Um, so it's used by most people to do almost everything. And even these account for only a tiny minority of computers on Earth. 
most of the computers on Earth are embedded microcontrollers in things like airbags and coffee machines and dishwashers uh, and all those other things. So computing as a technology is even more universal collectively than an individual smartphone is. Um, so there's some key ideas, right? This move towards the practical universality as the book goes on and the idea of the computer as a uh, universal technology solver. The other idea that I'm sure you've already heard, right, as well as the idea of the computer being universal, essentially because it's a Turing machine, because it's programmable, is that this is all driven by Moore's law. Um, and of course, there has been this remarkable process of increases in the power, and decreases in the size, complexity, and power consumption of electronic technology, which has driven all that, right? There's no way you could build a step counter using the electronic building blocks that ENIAC was built out of. Um, at the same time, one of the points that we want to make in the book, we only get to the chip um, in chapter, oh, where do we get to the chip? Chapter four, I think. Um, and we only get to the microprocessor in chapter seven. But even before that, this, is, this picture is taken in 1962 and uh, from the Ballistics Research Laboratory where ENIAC was used. And it shows women who are part of computing staff holding one digit of storage from a succession of machines. So this is what one decimal digit of storage from ENIAC looked like. And when we get over to the one on the right, which is in London Zoom there, uh, let's see, it's even smaller than the one next to it. It's about this big because it's transistorized. So even before Moore's law, um, and the process uh, discussed from the 1970s onwards, chips rapidly shrinking. This was already happening with other electronic technologies. Um, but of course, one point is, yeah, you call it the law, but it's, it's not like this was some process of nature, right? That this somehow inevitably happened. It involved an incredible amount of research, many different accomplishments, an enormous amount of spending. One of the things we stress in the book is that the role of the US military and government was crucial in this, particularly from the 40s to the 70s. So from funding initial computers like ENIAC for defense purposes, uh, air defense networks, um, then the government's airspace programs being the initial um, market for some of the chips, miniaturized electronics, etc. Right. So this is what the hard disk drive looked like in the early 60s. Um, did you see a head of the lady standing next to it there? Um, and we got uh, them here. That's what you say. Yeah, that's no, not the other case. Well, people online aren't seeing this. Uh, this is what a portable computer looked like in the late fifties. It's a vacuum tube device built into a forty-foot full-scale trailer. Right. You can drag that window down. Yeah, that's true. And I guess people online aren't seeing it anyway. All right. No. But I think when you share when you share a screen on Zoom, you don't see the Zoom, right? Usually. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't show on Zoom. It's just on the screen here. So you drag the Zoom. Oh, that's better. All right. You can drag the Zoom controls out there. Yeah. Now, I suppose I was going to say a little bit about how this differs from previous over the industries. So, I mean, this is a, a scholarly book. Right? We, we don't want it to be you know, intimidating and difficult to read. We want readers who are not professional historians, and I think we're getting them. Um, but at the same time, it's published by MIT Press, which is an academic press. And we see it as a continuation of the work involved in particularly these three earlier scholarly overview histories. Uh, Mike Williams in the History of Computing Technology, uh, Martin Campbell, Kelly and Neil Nasper's Computer, and A History of Quantum Computing by Paul Ceruzzi, I might have a lot on the current book. Um, one of the questions that we had to answer, we can really start to see what our answer is. To answer, to write a history like this is a computer, then you have to come up with an answer to the question, what is the computer? And our answer is, it becomes many, many different things. The only thing is, tend to focus on one or another aspect of what the computer becomes. So Williams was writing in the 80s, really looked at the computer in the context of the evolution of 
technologists for adding GPT calculators. I'm um, going back to adding machines, making these phones, and so on. It's also just where the books stop. So the final chapter of this book, called Later Developments, kind of the 50s and early 60s. Campbell Kelly and Asprey, um, writing in the mid 90s, took a broader approach, and they, they primarily, their, their title is a history of the information machine. So this feature is an information machine. They focus primarily on business oriented applications. So they're not starting out so much with adding machines, uh, they're starting out with finding cabinets and forms and procedures and people carrying out large scale image processes manually, and then looking at how that becomes the main application of computers in the 1960s. Um, their book's got 12 chapters uh, in the most recent edition, 2013. It gets to personal computers in chapters 10 and 11, and the internet, web, ARPANET, email, social media, etc. in the last chapter. So it's the last quarter of the book that's dealing with everything from the Altair and the start of personal computing onwards. And Paul Saruz's book, uh, History of One Computing, which ours replaces, was focused more on computer technology and architecture. So it actually started out in the 40s. It didn't so much conceptualize the prehistory of computing in terms of adding machines or of business computing because it started when the electronic computer came to existence. And I'd say his key theme there really is the emergence and spread of interactive computing. Um, so when the book was finished, the last two chapters were about workstation students of the net in the original version, and the chapter before that was about the IBM and the CMAC, etc. Um, the 2003 edition added uh, a little bit on then recent events. And if you're not a specialist uh, historian and you've read a book on this, you've probably read Walter Isaacson's The Innovators. Um, and that's more of a popular history. So it says it's a book about the digital revolution, it's sort of about innovators. So it puts a focus on inventing technologies. And essentially, you can look to see what he features. It's really how much he is about like his how this thing is invented. So we came back. Um, so we have got uh, right, programmable computers. And he talks about those, but only up to the fifties. He talks about microchips, but only up to the very first microprocessors. He talks about the internet um, and the ARPANET up to 1973, personal computers, very heavily focused on the earliest developments and standards and so on. And that's something that's different with Apple. We try and talk not just about the beginnings of things, but about the middle and end of them as well, so that you can trace those trajectories through. Um, now, of course, Walter Isaacson, I took this page at random a couple days ago, I just put these slides together. He got the top three spots. Uh, in computer industry history, you know, that book is going to sell, say, 20 of as many than MIT would throw a party for us. Um, so it's a different kind of thing, but we're, we're trying to do, I think, the same job as Isaacson and those other academic authors in coming up with a book that you can say, here is one version of what's the story of the computer from ENIAC through to sometimes last year. Right. So our book is replacing Paul's classic 1998 book. And we were concerned to build on the strengths of the original book. So Paul's previous book is the most widely cited overview history of computing. Uh, if you look at the reviews on Amazon, you'll see a bunch of people you know, read it, found it. Um, it made its way out into a broader audience. Uh, it was assigned for teaching purposes in courses, particularly in computer science departments. I want to make sure that anyone who liked the previous book would not be disappointed by this one. Um, so one of the points that we, we doubled down on was Paul's engagement with computer architecture. Uh, one thing that stood out with versus the other of few histories was a focus on mini computers, Unix, and interactive computing as being what becomes really important about computing as it develops. Uh, he had a treatment of programmable calculators and personal computers that uh, I know a lot of people enjoyed. Um, and so we wanted to build on those strengths. At the same time, a book like this, uh, when you think about redesigning it, refactoring it, it's got multiple readerships with different needs. So some people are undergraduate students who assign the book in class. 
You can see from the people who were citing it. Um, it was also a book that if you're a graduate student, um, either in computing or in another area of history, you just wanted one book to go to to say that. What do I need to know about the history of computing? Those are what people go to for that purpose. And similarly, if you were a scholar working in another area, science and technology studies, internet studies, you did a grounding in relevant history. Um, and computer scientists who want to know something about where that data come from. Um, although it is only incidentally a computer history of computer science, it's really a history of computer technology and practice. Uh, and early on, I think Paul doesn't like to read his own reviews, but um, as I was coming on board to update and rework the book, I wasn't shy about that. And I felt this Amazon review here captures something of the challenge that we had. So, according to the author of this uh, positive Amazon review uh, from 2016, he never thought that Saru's was closing date in 2003 seems to be a long time ago. Communicating to him when he had fun or of the data's interpretations. And these sets of uses have not emerged from Saru's history of manufacturers and model numbers. Communicating is as much as part of music computers today as what happens with an arms reach at one's desk. And then the author of the review mentioned in fact digital photography um, as an example of something that became very important and hadn't been covered in Paul's earlier book or in any of the other old people's histories that we've been using. There's some other new expectations too. So in general, scholars looking at the history and um, the uh, social analysis of technology have been paying much more attention to the users, not just to technologists, producers, inventors. And the way the world has changed over the last couple of decades also compels you to look at the other way. Right? In the late 90s, I mean, Microsoft was an up and coming company, it's big, IBM was one of the biggest companies on the planet. But uh, computing was increasing in the quantity economy, but it was nothing like, as it's to say, as oil companies. Right? Today, I'm not sure if it's still true actually after today, but very recently there were five trillion dollar companies in the world, and they were all tech companies, right? Amazon, um, Alphabet, Microsoft, Tesla, um, and one other one, but it's tech as well, right? Um, so we had really to take that on board. And we couldn't just tell the story of the technology itself. We also needed to, somewhere, somewhere in the book, grapple with the fact that um, during the last couple of decades, this has become something that's just so fundamental to the economy, to politics, to um, many aspects of our daily lives. So, objectives for the new book. Um, you could try and tell a story like this in another one. Right? You could try and say, write a much smaller book that is focused on the lives of six individuals who think come up with it up. Or five, five famous um, software systems, right? Um, and I'm sure people write books like that. But this one is more of a comprehensive history where we try and cover uh, as much as we can key hardware and software systems and developments to tell the story in a very comprehensive kind of way while also covering that huge range of things that the future is to come. And that meant that it was kind of like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, we put all these pieces, you know, where do I put this one, where do I put this one? How do we make this kind of story, not just a list of model numbers? Um, we want to be as accurate as possible. So we really put a lot of work into getting all the chapters read by experts in the area, checking the facts. Uh, we knew that we were leaving out a vast amount of detail pretty much every but at the same time, we want to make sure that the words that we did write were all true. That an expert would come along and wouldn't say, well, that's just not true. They would say, that's true, but it leaves things out. We can handle that. We don't want people to tell us that we got anything actually wrong. Of course, a few people have said that, but on balance, I still feel good uh, that it hasn't happened very much. Uh, one book to be readable, all right? There's no academic jargon there. When we do have to use a technical term, we try and explain it in the first use, although say, you don't know what. And interrupt is, you'll probably have to go to the Wikipedia page as well to really understand it. Um, we don't talk about Heidegger, for example. Uh, and more so even in the earlier histories where when they were new, we knew people would come to this book wanting to understand where their smartphone apps come from and that kind of thing. So we couldn't just stop the history in the year 2000 or even in the year 2010, 
try to come as close up to the uh, present as possible, basically up to 2021. And since Paul wrote his original book in the late uh, mid-90s, just a bit of explosion of new scholarship in the history of computing. So we wanted to, as the book that is kind of telling this big story, to tell it by drawing on and summarizing as much as we could of the excellent work that's been done by many other scholars um, over the last 25 years. Um, and as I said, people are more concerned now with users. Um, so the idea was to take seriously computer applications. I mean, people don't... Way back at ENIAC, it was built for the task of calculating firing tables to use with guns in World War II. Nobody builds a computer just to have a computer. New kinds of computer hardware and software get produced because people have got applications that they want to do, and they need to create new kinds of technologies to support that. So we really wanted to interweave the stories of applications and users in with the stories of the new um, technological innovations that are inspired by their needs and enable the creation of those new kinds of applications. All right, so that's the challenge, right? And that's our objectives. So how did we go about actually trying to make that happen? Well, we're influenced by the work of the late uh, Princeton historian, Michael S. Mahoney. One of the other books I made was a collection of Mahoney's papers. And I was particularly taken by his paper, Histories of Computing. Uh, history of, of computing-ings, right, pluralizing it. So according to him, there's traditionally been a narrative that basically is, is as if you've got all these different things in the world and all somehow feed into the creation of ENIAC and the other early computers in the 40s, and then the computer once invented goes out to change the world in many different areas. So you kind of consider all this stuff in as much as it influences the original design of early programming computers, but then stories often in practice treat that stuff as having its own logic that's separate from applications and users. And the honey argument does something different, which is reflected in some ways in our book, um, which is to think of computing in the natural sciences, say, as having its own trajectory from pre electronic computers to modern scientific computing and separate trajectories and things like data processing, management, and military command and control. So to think of those things as largely separate and parallel stories. Um, but there was one description kind of thing that particularly reflects what we're trying to do in this book. The history of these continuing experiences of the various communities showed that they wanted and expected different things from the computer. They encountered different problems and levels of difficulty between their practice to it. As a result, they created different computers, or who they meant the singular plural, Computings. Um, now, as different user communities tried that work of rebuilding their practices around the potential of electronic computing and also rebuilding electronic computing around what they needed for their applications and practices, that's how we're trying to tell the story of where these other developments come from in areas of architecture, communication, storage, etc. Right. The idea is um, something like a graphical user interface, um, a sort algorithm, et cetera, is inspired by the need of a particular class of users. But as the story goes along, those become part of the standard toolkit of computing and computer science that then are applied in different areas. So when we're talking about, about the computers becoming this or becoming that, we're not talking just about a piece of hardware. We're really talking about a package are stacked levels of hardware, software, architecture, and the knowledge and techniques and human skills that go around applying that to do all the many things that over time computers are applied to. All right, so finally, the structure of the book. Right? This is what we came up with. So it's got 50 chapters. In the first one, the computer is invented. The last one is the epilogue. Almost every chapter is called the computer becomes something. So that's our idea, right? How we, how we try and deal with this enormous huge topic is by saying the big picture story of how the computer becomes kind of universal. is almost a collection of short stories, each one of which has their own arc and protagonists, in which the computer becomes a scientific super tool, right, from chapter two. 
computer becomes a data processing device in chapter three, a real-time control system in chapter four. As we said, in each chapter, we're dealing with the needs of a particular community of users. So we thought a lot about what's the art in each chapter. For example, the computer becomes a scientific super tool, runs from the first IBM mainframes, scientific users in the early 50s, through the famous Crane 1 supercomputer in the late 70s. And there's a continuity there um, that I think gives that chapter some kind of coherence. The computers cost millions of dollars. The lead user um, for the machine, which doesn't matter, chapter is always, always Los Alamos, almost always Los Alamos, or one of the other national labs. It's its weather simulation. They're doing enormous jobs that will occupy the biggest computer on Earth the day after day. So, like ENIAC, they're about doing one really good really job, not balancing the needs of a whole load of jobs simultaneously, etc. So, instead of splitting it up and saying, well, we've got 14 chapters, we've got about 70 years, each chapter is going to be five years, we try and have each chapter be one of these stories, and each individual chapter is maybe going for 25 years. So, it also means that the chapters are overlapping in time. And figuring out how to do that coherently was a big job, and I, I hope we succeeded. Although, we'll have to leave it to the readers to give a final verdict on that. So, for example, those first three chapters, in which the computer becomes a scientific super tool, a data processing device, a real time control system, all basically run from the early 50s to the late 70s, maybe a little bit into the 1980s. So, as we go through time, as we go through the book, we're moving primarily forwards in time. We're also dealing with the fact that the truth is none of these stories are over in five years or ten years. They're kind of overlapping. And also, the computer never stops being any of these things. Right? Computers, there are still giant computers running nuclear simulations of Los Alamos. There are still huge data processing batch jobs running to handle your credit card transactions, etc. But over time, the technology that's developed for one application can be extended to another application eventually in incremental steps to compete to become something new. Until, say, by chapter 11, we get into media devices, web publishing, cloud computing, ubiquitous computing. So that's how we try and challenge, tackle that challenge of going from the 40s to the present day, and the enormous changes in terms of who's using computers, what they used them for, how many computers there are in the world, that make it hard to tell a continuous story through those discontinuities. So the idea each chapter has its own narrative arc, we put those things together, building on the technological engagement of Paul's original book, and we do this job of explaining how basically this cluster of hardware, software, technology skills from chapter to chapter becomes bigger. We do more things um, in SDS jargon, develops new affordances um, so that eventually computers are able to replace the insides of televisions, phones, media players, etc. If you want to know more about how we actually wrote the book, there's a Segan University working paper that gets into uh, I see this working paper as being like the bonus making of feature on DVD. So it was when we were about halfway through the book that we described what we were trying to do and how we were going about it. Um, and uh, you can find that one on my webpage or Google the title of it, Finding a Story for the History of Computing. All right, so the book is finished now. What are the new things, and this is the last major section, um, that we are covering that those earlier history did? And you've got a sense of this, I think, when I talked about where they stopped. Um, so, so we're drawing heavily on the excellent recent secondary literature. Uh, and fortunately, scholars have come along and written really excellent books about things like the history of time sharing. There's this huge literature appeared recently on uh, the video games, networking in the ARPANET, the history of graphics, uh, graphical user interfaces, etc. So um, a book like this, you can't kind of go into the archives and become the expert on every aspect of the story this big. So there is some that we have great personal knowledge of or we've written about previously. Or, for example, we knew a lot about computers in space flight, we knew a lot about the history of space management systems. 
But there were other areas where we were extremely glad to be able to draw on and summarize these books and give credit to their authors. One of the things we talked about in this book that was completely absent in those four earlier uh, overview histories that I mentioned, for example, is home computing, right? So there's this period, personal computing got going with enthusiasts, hobbyists, and mobility users from kids in the 70s. And people always write about that. Everyone writes about the home computer club and the Apple II. On the other hand, the Commodore 64, for example, uh, in this advert here, the best selling desktop computer of all time by a wide margin. It's not mentioned in any of the previous overview histories of computing. Um, and it's machines like that that came along in the early 80s, were produced by the million, uh, sold very cheaply, ordinary people bought them home, plugged them into the TV, etc. But exposed the whole generation of people around my age to programming in the domestic context. Um, they bought video games home. Now, I've taken machines also at computers with you know, a different input device running a program that's in wrong, but they're computers too. So that was another thing that we wanted to get into the book. Um, and generally taking video games seriously and taking home computers seriously is something we're doing here that the previous overview histories haven't. Um, the previous overview histories does not have very much to say about uh, gender and labor. Um, those are some of the things that my training as a historian focused on particularly. Um, so we mentioned that in a number of areas, for example, there's the famous um, email operation stuff of ENIAC in its original days, uh, data processing work, but also the masculinity is agenda too. Um, one of the concerns that people have in computing is the male dominated nature of computer science and many computer applications. Um, so there's some interesting things like here with this advert for an early home computer. You can see how they're trying to imagine a home. Right? So a home computer, you have to imagine what does a computer look like that makes sense in that home? Computers have been big in personal things before, right? What kind of computers does it make sense for a family to use in their living room? But you also have to imagine what kind of a home needs a computer, right? What kind of applications does it make sense um, to think of people doing that? And one of the ironies here is that with things like this is here that we introduced in the book that's trying to show a family this is what you'll do with a computer. It's it's a real like old school 1950s kind of sitcom you know, white, middle-class, suburban family. Um, coming out in the 80s, just actually as American society is changing and that kind of traditional family model is um, most definitely not the future at that point. But people are trying to imagine what does this home look like after the computer revolution and they come up with something like that. So that's an example of this thing where thinking a little bit about gender and masculinity and so on uh, help, you know, genuinely understand what's going on in this story in a deep kind of way without um, undercutting the flow of the narrative, right? Another thing I'm pleased with that we managed to do justice to with its own chapter, chapter 11, the computer becomes a universal media device, are um, all these computers in the world that don't look like computers, right? So here's the original iPod. Um, here's the Roland TR-808 drum machine. Um, and some of these things that people at the time thought of to be uh, So this actually says rhythm composer computer control here on the machine itself. So the idea is that essentially these things were computerized, and so this is like the new application of PC technology. They tend to be outside the scope of what we necessarily think of as being computers and the way that those categories stuff is out. Um, so, so we tell the story of fax machines, DVD players, digital cameras, using mm -hmm. synthesizers, etc. Uh, you know, those media playing devices that have got microprocessors inside that are running code, etc., but do not look like what we traditionally think is computer being. Um, and we also, much more than previous years of the industry, is trying to take seriously graphics and games as crucial things that have driven the development of computing technology in fundamental ways and are also vital to computing as their experience today. Um, so some of the stories we have there earlier, we have um, Space War from MIT, uh, an early and highly influential interactive video game, uh, suddenly it's a sketch pad program, then as we get into the um, 
80s, 90s, we talked about graphics workstations, graphics, etc., 3D hardware, and how that gets shrunk down into games consoles, how 3D becomes incredibly important for home computing, right? Because the only people who are going to buy a desktop computer these days are video gamers, they have these enormous graphics cards. Except the last few years, no one's been able to buy a graphics card because everyone's been buying them to mine Bitcoin with. And the latest, most powerful supercomputers in the world are also relying heavily on graphics processor technologies. So, so even if you don't care, care at all about video games, games and only care about point in computing, this story still, still can't be told without looking at how video games drove the development of that technology. And over time, the main processor in a, in a desktop PC became more of an ancillary device to the graphics card where the real processing was happening. Um, and I'm glad that we managed to get that story into the big picture story of computing for the first time. Another thing weirdly that no one had really written about before, um, and I cared a lot about personally, was the evolution of the IBM PC. So the previous several really industries um, tend to say, and then that IBM came out with the PC, and that's pretty much the end of them talking about the IBM PC and then the PC came out of the world. But, but the original machines that IBM produced in 1981, 1984, that our current computers are descended from, well, well, that's totally different from it, right? So this, this is, is kind of an IBM PC pattern. You know, you could actually run old software on it. But it has no, no piece, no connector, nothing whatsoever in common with those original IBM machines. And IBM itself had lost control of the PC standard in the late 80s. Uh, and in the 90s, a period of enormously rapid change in desktop and personal computing, no single company could redesign PC uh, the way IBM had been able to, because it's split between industries. You had entire uh, com companies that just make keyboards, just make cases, just make graphics cards. So those so all had to fit together in a standard way to model the line of own machines. Um, that also facilitated things like the entire departure of computer manufacturing from the US to Asia, because companies could just focus on making one commodity part. So we talked about the whole evolution of the PC and the PC industry in that way in chapters eight and chapter 10. And that's not a story that really had been told before in other people's computing. I, I feel it's just fundamental to understanding what happened um, during the 90s. Um, another thing that we've done that is different from those previous histories is really take computer communication seriously, not just by having a chapter about the internet at the end, but by threading that through the development of computers. Because computers have been communicating in real time since the 1950s. The ARPANET, which becomes the internet, had been around since the early 1970s, technically the very, very early 1960s. So you can't just start talking about communication when the web happens. Um, so, so we follow we that, that story, story you know, through time sharing computing, through military systems, through bulletin board systems, um, looking at the internet and local area networking, and we thread that. There's not a communication chapter, there's not a software chapter. We thread the software, we thread communication through the chapters of the book, looking at how they interact with these new applications through which the computer became new things. But of course, when we get to the end, it's all communications because we've got two chapters primarily on the internet. Uh, that one's about the old school web about publishing chains. Chapter 13 is basically about how the web stops being about displaying static pages and becomes a, essentially a replacement for old school terminals and universal front end onto applications which run primarily on servers but do some processing on the book. Um, and then Chapter 14. So in some ways, many readers just, just, if they find the book through Amazon, they really don't care about where does my smartphone come from. They might want to know, why do I have to have the other 30 chapters first? And of course, because there's so much written about Facebook, about smartphones, etc. It's not like we can give in one chapter or a couple of chapters a unique given to treat with any of those things. But we can show how much those modern computing technologies sit on top of all the developments in the earlier chapters. So, for example, in many ways, cloud computing and smartphones is a return to an earlier model of 
large centralized institutions you have access to from town meetings. You know, I think there are differences, but I think if you don't have that whole broader history of the town meeting, you can't understand this deeply what's been going on in the recent past. So you know, other people are going to write entire books about things like cookies and so on. Right? Our job is just to try and show how those things fit into the big picture. I also want to say, uh, I last thought, my, my career has taken some weird, weird shapes. And uh, I last thought an overview for us on the history of despite having you know, written with Paul this book in the year 2001. Um, so 21 years later, the books come out, I teach the Gemini semester. And I mean, I mean, I think for a lot of people who are older, they tend to think, well, India had a really long time ago, but you know, the Apple II can't be that long ago, because I still remember. It's basically 22 years from India to the Apple II. And from 1977 to 2022, right? Let me see, we are looking at another 45 years. Twice as long. So, when Paul wrote the original book, he was able to assume that people had an idea what might be in He was like, not so slight, and so on. And that's just not true anymore. And that was what happened to me this semester when I was teaching the book. So, it's very interesting to make sure to explain things about what those systems look like, what it was like to use them, not take technology for granted. But students reading it, it tends to, you know, just flow over them. So, what I did to teach you was. Uh, get a space in the essentially the attic of the history department and turn it into a working retro computer lab. Going from an Apple II through to an iMac, um, succession of different PCs, some uh, British uh, home computers here, a Sinclair and BBC machine that we write about in a book and so on, and have the computers to spend time there and do, uh, do projects, one of their, as well as a regular paper, a hands on experience paper. Sometimes there's a student working with a page maker on a 1992 Windows PC, uh, people learning to program the basis on that too, use the original physics help, um, and so on. And uh, I actually felt that that conjunction of text with some hands on experience of the machines themselves um, was a really interesting way of helping the students learn. I tried to think how to scale it for a larger class. So that was an undergraduate seminar with 15 people. I will bet you to the lecture until I'm still trying to figure that out. Anyway, wrapping this thing up. Um, so, so, I know when people will this book, book. if you take that from the right to review, um, they're probably going to say the book is too long, and then they're going to say, and why didn't you talk about all these things? <laughs> so, here's your discussion with me, right? Maybe we'll write it in the next session. Some of them, right? The computer becomes an industrial control device. So that's not important, right? Industrial control, embedded systems, etc. We'll touch on that at the end of the book. Uh, I think it's basically because of all specific activities in aerospace, uh, military things, the curator to the National Air and Space Museum. We've looked instead at missile guidance systems, Apollo space shuttle. Uh, fly by wire aircraft and so on. Um, but uh, the computer becomes the most secure and highly reliable. Um, I think that there is so much um, of what's happened in the computer over the last few decades, basically, since Microsoft decided that you know, he wanted to bake uh, Internet Explorer into the middle of Windows. And then, you know, there were all those holes in the network where it got hacked and it wasn't going to be able to be that secure and so on. Um, so, so making computer, computer systems, systems reasonably secure and robust and trying to hack into them has become an enormous focus um, over the last few decades. And um, we only talked about that incidentally in the book. Maybe that should be another chapter. Maybe a chapter. Who knows? Uh, and of course, everything now is AI, 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 AI. AI. So you come to and you're like, well, where's the history of AI in this? And we think it's very explicitly. We don't really talk about the history of AI. Because, because until very recently, AI didn't really do anything much that actually went out there in the world and got used. Um, I could put some footnotes on that if I've offended anybody because of course things get developed as AI and then get caught with different etc. But um, we didn't find many places where we tell the story of computer technology as it's been used until very recently. 
related to AI, and this is not the history of computer science. Um, so imagine writing a separate article, basically, kind of on this topic of how to think about the history of AI. Um, we do talk about that at the end in terms of pattern recognition systems, based recognition, and optimization, classification. Um, but in terms of that book, that's like a blink you know, yeah. in, the, in the last few years. It's not like we, we found a lot to say about that in the 70s or 80s. Again, this is not a history of computer science. So my most frequently downloaded by far contribution to the communication is something called the Tears of Donald Canoe. Um, and that was just a title. People want to know, like, who made Donald Canoe cry? Like, you know, what bad person has done that to the lovely grandfather of computer science? And it turned out it's a story. And he was trying because we've done it down the history of computer science. And what I say in response, in large part, was the history of computing mostly is not the history of computer science. Right? Computer science is an academic discipline. Somebody should be writing the history of computer science, absolutely. Um, but that's not quite what we're doing here. We're writing the history of computing technology and practice. Now, I also happen to present the editor of the ACM Turing website. Um, so I did kind of think about that. Like, where are you knowing? Where can you get in the contributions of Turing Award? in a way where you can talk convincingly about how they've changed practice, um, etc. So, so definitely you will learn things about the history of computer science from reading your book. Um, and we found ways to weave that into the narratives like risk or development of algorithms. Um, but at the same time, there should absolutely be a one volume comprehensive history of computer science talking about intellectual developments, talking about the change in the shape of the field, talking about the ACM and so on. This is not that. Um, and as I think you'll have realized by now, any book like this is involving many compromises. Uh, there were cases where we wrote about one thing and not another because someone had written a really great book about one thing and we were able to draw on that and summarize it. And there were many cases where we would like to have gone into our things in the country because nobody had written with the sort of study of it, particularly the later chapters. If you look at the footnotes, which is how historians tend to read books about the end notes at the back of the book, they're kind of comprehensive and detailed in the early chapters, and then they get kind of skimpy in the later chapters. There aren't many, and most of the newspaper reports and things, because people haven't read the history of the last 15, 20 years or a bunch of stuff. We emphasize storytelling over theoretical analysis, so if you're hoping for media theory, you'll find it mostly. Um, and I know some people are going to look at the book. Um, it basically depends. If you compare us to earlier histories, you know, to say we have a lot more about computing access in the US, we have a lot more about things like gender, um, a little bit about race and sexuality, and so on. Um, if you compare it to um, what people have done in some more specialized studies, et cetera, then you might say, well, it's not structurally about gender, for example, right? What is it about? Well, it's, it's the biography the of a technology basis. The computer, this incredibly complicated, incredibly diverse technology. Um, within the academic history of computing, some people have called the descent in the computer. And within the context of a specific study, that can absolutely make sense, right? Because in many cases, the most interesting thing about how computing is changing aspects of the world isn't in the computer itself or the software, it's in what it's done you know, in that area. But a book like this is a comprehensive overview of computing. If there's a way to coherently structure that around anything other than the story of the computer, we weren't able to figure out what it is. Because the thing is, computers at this point are basically used by most people in the world to do most things. So a history of computing that is truly comprehensive would start out being this very narrow story about a small number of white people doing numerical things with one-off computers and building laboratories. And then as it went along, each chapter gets exponentially bigger until it would become this unfinishedly huge and enormous thing that the documentary was as large as just well. So to make that manageable, you can't try and be comprehensive in terms of the application, etc. You kind of have to center the computer and look at the evolution and think these core hardware and software features and so on to make this scope of the book doable 
and give you any kind of coherence it's not seem just completely random why are you talking about this thing why not this thing of course the story of each of these communities as i only talked about on that earlier slide the history of scientific computing, the history of business computing, the history of military computing, and then more recently, the history of social media, the history of computing and retail, e commerce, all of those things in canon should be, be not just a chapter, but you know, a whole book. Um, but, but for a book like this, this tries to do the whole thing in one volume. The way that we found to make that doable is to center on the computer itself and talk selectively about groups of users' applications. About ways it's going to change the world here and there, but not primarily to try and come up with a big picture answer of like, it is the way that it's going to change the world. Because of course, because Peter becomes so serious, it changes the world in many, many different ways. Right? You can't just, just try and say, here's the way that it changed it. So I'd say we don't offer a comprehensive answer to the question, how did the uh, computer change the world? But we, we try and be reasonably rigorous about talking about how the world changed the computer. But how these different technological features that exist today originally came into being, how they were motivated by the needs of different users. Now, really wrapping up here. So, the book finishes in a possibly unexpected place. I always knew where I wanted to to finish. I had to talk to Paul into it, so it came around again. Um, and that was a Tesla driving through Silicon Valley. Right? Now, why, why finish say, with Tesla and not with a smartphone? Right, since it's more recognizing the computer. Um, well, one of the things that we wanted to get at, as I mentioned previously, was the computer doesn't stop being any of the things that it becomes. So in that one car, you've got things that um, are very similar to doing lots of intense computation, just as Mitchie talked about earlier in the book. They build real time control. They're doing uh, a graphical user interface on the center of the screen. They're streaming digital audio, um, which is like the media devices we talked about in one chapter. And they're doing it over the internet, which is like we talked about in another chapter and so on. So, in a way, you can see this one thing is hard that it's moving continues around. We've got all these different kinds of computers working together to do a large part of the range of what computer technology can do. And of course, I think this has actually become something that's much more recognizable to people, right? A couple of years ago, most people had no idea that a typical middle-class family, so they've got some laptops, they've got some phones, they've got some tablets. That's not where their biggest investment in computer technology is. Their biggest investment in computer technology is sitting in the driveway or the carport, right? Everything else is now because of some way they are, because of some chip and they're not going to use this either because they cost twice as much as they used to. Um, it did all because, because of the auto to choose these council contracts early in the pandemic, the supply chain was disrupted, disrupted anyway. anyway. And the production of cars is a substantially, substantially, substantially down more than where it should be because of this reliance on computer technology. So I hope that actually that ending is going to resonate with people a little bit more now. You also have a car driving through Silicon Valley, right, where they built it. Um, where Elon Musk said we're a Silicon Valley software company, he says the car is tapped in wheels. Um, also, so talked about how innovation in, in the recent decades, most of the companies we've talked about in the last few chapters are concentrated in the Silicon Valley Bay area and maybe around also um, in the Greater Seattle area. And that's a definition of earlier in the book where we're talking about companies uh, and uh, creators of technology to spread around a lot more geographically. Um, and finally, during the pandemic, so then um, we talked a little bit about how computing had just uh, been in central in new ways to people's lives during the pandemic and lockdown. Um, especially that whole lockdown would not have been possible without tablets, the internet, etc. right? The option of just saying, uh, we're going to close down a lot of the economy and middle-class people are going to work at home for a year, right? That's not an option that should exist this 20 years as um, So, the ending, and this is maybe, uh, you know, you can get more fancy style in terms of it, but I'm just going to read the last paragraph and then stop, right? And so on and so on. 
So that's probably how you can read this point in the talk. Um, it's a big book, except for you know, just once once it finishes, it will itself. So, so. uh, by the and time you read this, many more things will have happened in the world, and a good proportion of them will have been made possible by computing technology. Yet this may be a good place to end our story. At the start of the 2020s, the story of modern computing has reached the beginning of an end as the last great story of modernist technological progress, fractures to later the end of postmodern chaos. Computing is deeply intertwined with vital structural developments in global relations, economic society, and culture. Barring an apocalypse, these connections will only deepen. As the computer has become a truly universal machine, the history of computing has become a part of the history of everything. Computing technology does not dictate the direction of history, but its affordance is to create new possibilities, advantage some choices over other, and rearrange economic and political incentives. We begin the story of modern computer with the debut of a single machine on the front page of the New York Times in 1946, and have followed its legacy to the point of asking whether liberal democracy can survive the internet. There's little prospect of squeezing an answer into this book. Once computers became part of every infrastructure, the idea of the computer as a machine in the traditional ENIAC, a self-contained device that's used to tackle different jobs by creating new programs, has become less relevant. The conceptual problem with the idea of universal solvent is always that if any such a substance was ever concocted, no flasks contain it. Our protagonist, which has dissolved so much in the world that once seemed permanent, has finally dissolved itself. So the world is full of computers, but again, only a tiny fraction of them or even recognizable to us as being computers. Um, so that's the end of the talk, but I, I believe my uh, co author, Paul Ceruzzi, uh, would like to say a few words uh, before we have a more general discussion. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you uh, for inviting me, and uh, thank you, Tom, for picking up the baton. Uh, you know, the first uh, edition, what was it, 1998, you know, wow, way back then. Um, I, I think that it's, uh, it, it really is a difficult uh, topic to get your hands around. Obviously, we've, we've tried, I think we've succeeded. Um, I, I talked about uh, um, this notion of the universal solvent about how, I don't know if I'm allowed to share screen or not, but uh, uh, the idea of all the things that were dissolved uh, by the computer. It's an old myth. You invented a, a universal solvent and then you say, well, what, what container is going to hold it? I, I posted this one time at a talk uh, in front of some philosophers and they, they went down to this part about college professors and they got very angry with me. Um, we've seen Zoom classes. I don't know whether that part maybe... I should erase that, but uh, you know, Wikipedia, you know, encyclopedias tell you all. Well, you can look at the group. You know, you can see all the things that uh, all the things that were that were uh, uh, dissolved by the computer. It's a crazy, crazy thing. Um, the the other thing I, I talked about this myth about the universal solvent. Another myth that would be very interesting is the one of King Midas. Everything he touched turned to gold. And this sounds, it sounded up until a few weeks ago, I guess, or months ago, it sounded like Silicon Valley, right? You throw some coders together, bang out some code, and then you're billionaires. You got a, uh, what do they call it? Unicorn. Except the King Midas hugged his daughter and his daughter turned into a gold statue. And that was a bad idea. And maybe that's what's happening in Silicon Valley. I don't know. It's just a myth. But uh uh, it's obviously a very difficult thing to get a hold of this uh, topic because it's still moving very fast. We try, and I think you'll like the book. I hope you look at it, and um, we welcome any criticism. There are things we didn't do, I know, um, uh, and it's hard to keep up with things. Um, I, said in the, I said in the first edition <laughs> that the, the history of AI is better written by a computer than by a person. <laughs> And I still believe that, <laughs> but anyway, we'll see what happens. So uh, thanks, Tom, and maybe we should open it up to other uh, comments. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Paul, and thank you, uh, Tom, for the uh, wonderful, great uh, talk and the uh, and the book. Uh, very, very exciting, and um, and we have we have a lot of uh, different types of questions. Um, so actually, maybe I'll start the question and answer with my first question. So um, 
when we talk about the history of computing, right, one of the things that we need to also talk about, and I'm not sure if you mentioned it in the book or the chapter or not, is um, the figure of Vannevar Bush, right? So when he was the one, people don't know, don't know Vannevar Bush, right? He was the one who was kind of the project leader for the Manhattan Project and started to do this kind of scientific um, and innovation um, within academia and industry and, and kind of like was a kind of the foreshadowing of like, you know, DARPA and, and defense and all that kind of, you know, research or so. So um, do you talk about a little bit about him? Because I feel like he was actually one of the ones that was a very good um, foreshadower of what we have right now for computing. So if uh, you remember, he wrote an article in The Atlantic, which was on uh, as, uh, uh, as We May Think. And he actually talked about a vision regarding about this device called the Memex, which you could go ahead and easily kind of like a Rolodex to be able to find things and capture things on video and, and things like that. But he didn't mention the, the specific types of technologies. But if you think about it, the web right now also has that type of you know features of, of what he was saying about. But there's still a lot of things that still have not been developed within that particular Memex. Could you guys maybe like um, comment um, on a, on a little bit about that? We do mention him briefly, um, but we don't go into too much about the Memex. Uh, the Memex, uh, it, it, it was uh, a little bit ahead of its time. It was not realized. Uh, he did, he did uh, uh, construct a machine called the Rapid Selector, but it was, really didn't go anywhere. Um, but the idea, of course, was very, very influential, especially uh, Douglas Engelbart at NASA read it, and it changed his life. The guy who eventually invented the mouse and also... Uh, a real pioneer in, in what we now call uh, hypertext. So uh, we do mention him, but briefly, yeah. Of course, the, the, he's known in the history, the hardware history of an analog, the analog computer, the, the uh, differential analyzer. And the interesting thing there is that the ENIAC was considered a differential analyzer, only it used uh, discrete, they didn't use the word digital at the time, but they, it used discrete uh, pulses instead of analog voltages. So. Uh, uh, in a sense, the ENIAC was the uh, implementation of the of the differential analyzer. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, we have some questions on uh, Zoom, so I'll go through um, each one of them. So Isaiah Brown asks about uh, how much longer can Moore's law continue? Clock speeds have stagnated since 2006, the end of Denard scaling, and if transistors get too small the effects of quantum mechanics start to hinder operation. Uh, that's Any? probably true. Yeah, it's uh, it's slowed down. Um, I think what's happened now is that the original von Neumann architecture of having a central processor has given way to multiple cores and also graphics, graphics pro GPUs, graphics processing units, which is a, a way of finessing that whole problem of, of, uh, of Moore's law hitting a wall. It has hit a wall, but I am not an electrical engineer, so maybe I better uh, hold off on that. Okay, um, second question we have is from Barry Finko. Uh, so what about analog computers, such as the Reeves, R-E-A-C? Uh, I saw a, a rack at Argonne when I was using a Cray-designed desktop computer in 1966. Well, I mentioned I mentioned the differential analyzer. Uh, we talk about we talk a little bit about it, about signal processing. And if you look at old uh, classic communications uh, equipment, you have lots of and some of you double E people will know what I'm talking about. You have lots of inductors, capacitors, resistors, uh, and transistors all lined up to uh, to process a signal. And uh, what came along was some uh, one of the breakthroughs that we talk about is the, the invention of the, the fast Fourier transform, among other things. Now you look at a radio, it's all software to find radio. You got, a, you got an, a, a, an antenna, you got an RF amplifier, you got an AD converter, and then everything's done on a microprocessor. All those other things are gone. And that also moved into the whole processing of music and sound, uh, the whole chat. We have a whole chapter about, about music and sound, and it's all done with a microprocessor now. So uh, 
I, I think the fast Fourier transform was a real uh, breakthrough there that kind of pushed analog analog design. And if there's any old time uh, analog uh, double E people on Zoom tonight, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, uh, it's really weird to look at a modern communications receiver and all you see is a chip. <laughs> it's like, where's all the, you know, where are all the induct, where's all the capacity, you know, all that stuff gone. <laughs> Yeah, so I'd say we, we talk about how yeah, so I'd say we, we talk about how digital things have replaced analog things, but the book itself is very much the story of the digital things. Uh, and another project, uh, I, I edited a book called Exploring the Early Digital, and I put an ongoing project um, uh, edited volume Becoming Digital. And that's talking much more about what digital really means and what analog was and how it's different and things like that. But unfortunately. I don't know if All right. Um, a question from Rick Simkin. How did students react to seeing Gen working with previous generations of computers? Oh, interesting. Were they mesmerized? Were they like, oh my goodness, this actually existed before my time? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the students liked it. Um, I mean, they tended to say it's a bit depressing to me, actually. How would they say that now? We found that the early class was very hard to relate to. The part of the independent systems and the data process. Like, I think that would be the case. So, so we moved through some of the earlier chapters too. I mean, they're reading them with additional, additional readings. So I mean, to get to chapter seven quickly, and that was the first chapter that we had any equipment for. And then when I drag something into the seminar room, like at the end of the session, I tend to kind of press around and, and use it. So they had. Um, it definitely was something like being able to see an Apple II and use it versus reading about it. Um, I think that hands on part is really important. I mean, there are a lot of YouTube videos about these things. So if you're trying to teach this and you don't have access to the original things, you can use YouTube videos and emulate it. I think it's something about the, the physicality, you know, pushing the keys, seeing the fuzzy, multicolored text, you know, that kind of stuff, hearing the disk drives clunk, like lifting the lid off and seeing the head seeking and so on. Um, Give them a sense of what's really going on with the technology. Um, so they found it much harder, much easier to relate to things once we got to the lab. And there's a part of the book say where we talk about how um, in the 70s, if you want to do word processing, you really want a CPM computer hooked up to a terminal. So you get 80 characters and you get an upper and lower case text. And it was hard to do those things with an Apple and you get extra hardware. You had to bash shift key repeatedly to change between upper and lower case. Soul, soul wires and so on. Um, but on the other hand, when Viscount, the first spreadsheet comes along, the yeah. Apple has got a 40 column uppercase only text screen, which is fine for a spreadsheet, but it can scroll around really quickly. This is good for a graphics hardware like this. Send characters one at a time over a serial cable. When you, when you scroll on a terminal, you see the screen ripple. When you do it on the Apple, you're like zooming around. And I think when they saw that, they could understand. That, that match between the busy cup and the Apple II and why it is the particular application. There's an interesting saying in the Stephen Lee reading that we had, why someone was saying that using busy cup was like flying a space fighter in Star Wars, right? It seems like a stretch, right? A spreadsheet space fighter. When you compare that interactivity that you got with the personal computer platform versus using a terminal, you know. So that kind of detail, you can write it in a book, but I think people only really appreciate it when you've got the two machines side by side. And they can use them themselves and see it. We have a question from um, Philip uh, Zakarek regarding about does chapter 14 delve into surveillance? Uh, uh, not really, sorry. <laughs> and then uh, we have one question here, and then we'll open, we'll open up the floor. We'll open up the floor uh, to the um, in person um, attendees. So um, the question here is from Ji Hua Wang is, uh, and actually it's a very interesting question because I also have I also a similar one too as well, is that what's your view of quantum computing? A bubble or a backbone for FinTech example blockchain? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I think it's an example of what happens when historians talk to computer scientists, that we just go back to the past and all the questions about the future. And, and one of the things you learn as a historian in IT is for decades, right, all the way back to, to our earliest chapters, um, people are talking about the idea of usually utopian futures, 
But they're always describing the potential of what every state wants to do in terms of this world where the cash is vanished, so everyone is using computers to see things, or they can communicate instantaneously, um, and they're making predictions. And one of the things that you tend to see actually is in many ways the predictions are always wrong. Um, although in the big picture, they tend to be wrong for some decades, and then often they don't expect to become true. <laughs> right? Like the idea that everyone is going to be doing shopping online. That kept failing and failing and failing, and then suddenly it succeeded. Or the idea that big companies are going to put all their data into gigantic data repositories, and management is going to be more about doing analytics and building models. I have just predicted in the 1950s about what would happen in the 1980s. And the 1990s, I came on the ring and thought, well, duh, that never happened. And then, you know, suddenly it did. Um, I, you can go, I think, to see certainly the elements of overhypedness and things crashing, um, right? I mean, if you were an investor and you were written more about the dot com boom, you might be slightly less likely to sink your life savings into terror and <laughs> and that kind of thing. Um, I personally think Bitcoin is not a scam that has no use case whatsoever except for criminals. And it's not actually physically capable of being used to process real transactions. And therefore, I personally expect Bitcoin eventually to have a value of zero because you're buying a share of something that has no value. Um, but that's just me as a human, as a historian. I have, to, I have no special right to make that prediction. Uh, what we need to do is see in the past and then you figure things out for yourself about it. All right, there's a question, another question here from Zoom, um, from Isaiah Brown. Um, the chip shortage and other shortages today seem particularly ominous after reading the book Limits to Growth. In the early 1970s, researchers at MIT studied how the economy would interact with the environment, and they wrote a computer program to run a simulation. The model predicted that we would start seeing shortages between 2015 and 2030. Are we seeing this prediction come true? Who wants to answer that one? I think, uh, let me try. I actually know about the history of that. Um, and this is especially with economists, um, right? So they took, to make that model, they took estimates of the known reserves various minerals and stuff, um, and extrapolated out a model that had estimates of population growth and stuff, and concluded that everything would run out quite soon. And economists pointed out that there's very little economic incentive to go out and find in the ground reserves of things that exceed what we needed over the next decade or two, right? And that in fact, as more, um, I think it's often the case that predictions tell you more about the state of the world at the time the prediction is made than when whether it's true or not. And I think that was the case of the limits to growth. Obviously, we've managed to handle a tremendous increase in world population since then, but there have been obviously effects. And uh, it's just different now, really. It's just very different, for, qualitatively different from what they predicted. Yeah. So, Paul, if I could say a little uh, on that, the, the report, you know, here's the MIT is an early computer modeling thing, and there was a debate among you know, economists um, about those predictions. And the gist was basically they didn't come true, right? Um, one of the reasons that I read about why, why that was was they were based on known reserves of things. But if you've got a 15 year known reserve of something, of these. That doesn't mean that's all that there is to be out there to be dug up of that natural resource. That means that there's an economic incentive to go out and respect for things when you've got, you know, a 15 year supply that will end up. So, in terms of commodity prices, you know, copper and iron and so on, they completely become true. Of course, global warming wise, yeah, definitely that is to be a limit to some kinds of growth, the most possible. Um, that we're only rather ineffectually um, dealing with at the moment. But so the chip shortage does not prove that. There is not a shortage of the raw materials in the chips. There's a shortage um, of chip manufacturing capabilities. And that has a lot to do with the whole just-in-time manufacturing globalization 
the concentration of manufacturing in a handful of places, um, the construction of supply chains on the other side of the world. And in particular, with the next generation, I believe, extreme ultraviolet machines. And I was reading in The Economist, I think they're literally, there's one company that makes the equipment that can work with that process technology. And I believe there's something like six chip fabricating plants that can do it. So that's economic and political and, and political economy limitations, but it's not that we've run out of silicon. So much a question, but uh, uh, hearing your talk brought back to me that when I first got into technology, which was pretty late, um, I was maybe five years old at the time. That's just a joke. <laughs> but uh, I went from, I think I encountered uh, uh, an Apple II, and then in the like immediate, like I would say, five-year period, worked on a PDP-11, a CDC cyber. Uh, next to that CDC cyber, which was the last year they used it, was a Next and then a PC. Oh, and I saw Lisa during that time period as well. So it's kind of, and a Commodore. So uh, kind of a trip back in the memory lane. Yeah, so you'll, you'll find all those things. Yeah, so you'll find all those things. You're gonna find all those things in the book. Um, but also, let's, let's just say that's the sense of how the world has moved on now, right? Because for you, it's an obvious joke to say you got into tech when you were five. But of course, the state of the world took you so long, right? Everyone expects their one year old to be scrolling around on the iPad and starting up videos and so on. Um, and that's another thing that I think we, we captured to some extent in the book. Um, and I think it's really interesting for the change in computer science and I think for the departure of women from computer science as well as the student how so the so people writing about in the 50s and 40s, 50s, 60s, if they come into computing, they'll be coming there in a work environment or in a college environment with a big computer that they'll come to for the first time because there's a job that they need to get done. And they know that if they can figure out how to program this thing, they'll be able to get their physics problem or their payroll problem or whatever it is, computers. And then there's this proliferation of home technology theory where people first experience something that um, you know, comes with a man, you have to see it, you now you're ready to program, so you're kind of messing around on writing basically on this program store. If you believe the man comes with your 80s home computer, uh, or if it's playing video games on. And that, um, some people who study this area's argument also change people's perceptions of what computer science is supposed to be about from being something that's more of a, a scientific thing that maybe is equally appealing. Basically, and I know this is just stereotyping here to boys and girls to being something that is about like obsessive hobbyist programmers and video games, which are things that many people believe predominantly are gendered masculine, but has been kind of off to uh, a more diverse. All right. Well, I think we're out of time. So I'd like to thank uh, Tom and Paul for being here this evening to talk about the history of computing and, and the book. and. Give a, let's give a round of applause for our first in-person uh, <laughs> meeting for ACM Chicago. Yeah, so thank you all for attending. And uh, yeah, if you haven't, uh, those online, you know, if you want to get the book, you can go to Amazon or so and uh, purchase the book. And, uh, you know, I definitely will have the book and I will definitely read it. Um, so looking forward to doing that. And uh, yes, uh, stay tuned. Uh, so we have our next. Oh, we have our next uh, also in-person and hybrid uh, meeting on June the 15th, Wednesday, June the 15th, with uh, Jorge Coca from uh, Very Good Ventures. He will he'll be talking about uh, Flutter, which is a uh, language or so that uh, Google is using uh, for developing mobile development. And also, uh, this um, uh, meeting was recorded, uh, so we will have the copy of the recording put onto our uh, ACM Chicago uh, YouTube uh, channel. So if you haven't subscribed to that, uh, we'll send you the links uh, to that and to the social media and the introduction slides that we presented uh, from the beginning. Uh, and also as well for those uh, who uh, want to get the professional development hour uh, credits for your professional engineering, uh, we will also provide that too as well. So uh, wait for an email 
and we will provide the link where you can go ahead and download and you can claim uh, for PDH. So anyway, uh, thank you everyone for attending, those that are in person and those that are online. And again, thank you to Paul and thank you to Tom um, for, for coming this evening. And uh, also thank you to Mark and to Greg and to the Loyola team for setting this up and uh, making it successful. Uh, it's the first time we've done this in a while, so we didn't know what to expect, but I think it went okay. Um, and uh, yeah, everything went well. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, have a good evening and uh, we will see you in person or online um, in June or a future meeting. So thank you all and take care, stay healthy and safe.